Okay, so hopefully everybody can hear me. Let's like start by welcoming you to our webinar today, metering more than just paywalls. Thank you all for joining. Um, so what we're going to do today is look at the metering technology and its uses in the publishing industry. First off, let me introduce myself. My name is Ben Catterall. I am the VP for Media and Publishing at MPP Global here in EMEA. Um, I'm the account manager for many of our EU clients, including Gremi in Poland, Unidad Editorial in Spain, and The Independent here in the UK. Um, and in case you don't know about MPP Global, um, we're the only market-leading cloud-based identity management, CRM, and e-commerce platform for the media and entertainment sectors. Uh, our clients include The Times, The Telegraph, and Condé Nast over in the States. Before we get going, just a few housekeeping reminders. Um, we're going to save all questions till the end of the session. Um, but if you do have a question in the meantime, there is a little button on the dashboard. If you press the hand, um, you can ask your question and then they can make note of any questions asked at the end of the session. So the agenda for today, the first thing we'll look at is the rise of metering. Uh, we'll introduce some of the meters that are being used by the market at the moment, so kind of the traditional usage of this technology. Um, we'll look at a couple of examples that are out there right now, uh, right there, right now. and we'll look at how metering has been de delivered up until now and some of the challenges it's created for publishers. Um, and then we'll finish this section by looking at some of the user groups metering helped publishers to identify. The second section will be to look at the opportunities that we believe metering can create. So what does the future of metering look like? We'll look at some of the forgotten benefits of metering content. So collecting data about your users and creating customer insights. And then we'll explore some of the newer, more innovative business models that metering is driving. So these will be both data-driven models, but also revenue-centric models. The third area we'll look at is industry best practice and some insights. So we've conducted a survey quite recently to gather markets thoughts on metering. Uh, and we'll look at the main topics that survey created and then we'll run a poll to further this research and keep it going. Um, the, the third, sorry, the fourth section will be some key considerations and some takeaways. So we'll end with the core topics that you should have in mind when thinking about introducing meters or adapting an existing integration that you may have. Okay, so let's start with a quick looking, quick look at metering as we know it. So the first thing I want to do is set the scene of the, the publishing market. So there are some stats and some graphs on the screen that show the paid content landscape. So these are stats from PwC, and what we can see is that audiences are consuming more digital content than ever before. Their willingness to pay for digital content continues to grow at a rapid pace, and the big opportunity from the graph on the left-hand side is to add a digital element to the current print subscribers packages. Uh, this growth is being seen on a global basis and is not confined just to the UK and the US as some of our uh, prospects and contacts seem to think. So what is metering? Many people assume that metering is purely blocking a user's access to your content. Uh, although this is a key area, we think there are many other uses for metering technology. It gives you the ability to learn more about your customers and then to create strategies and products based around them. These models could include block blocking access, but they also can include collecting data, generating revenue, and just creating a better understanding of what your audience are interested in. Uh, we think the meter is a scientific tool that has been limited in its application so far. So we'll look, now look at some of the models that metering has powered up until now, and then we'll follow that up with some of the new, more innovative models that we think will hit the market in the next six to 12 months. So the three most common models are appearing on your screen right now. The first of these is the soft or porous model, uh, also called the metered model. This is where the user is given a fixed number of page views before prompt being prompted to pay, or they may be asked just to register instead of pay in the first instance. This has been made popular by uh, newspapers including The Telegraph, The New York Times, and The New Yorker magazine in the States. The second model to consider is the freemium model, where a blend of purely free content and paid for premium content are available on the website. The premium content is often made visible with an, a logo or an icon, uh, and these models have been utilized by one of our clients, Dagbladet, in Norway, but also um, the Financial Times here in London. And the third model, the, the, this first model really is the hard paywall, as made famous by the Times and the Sunday Times. This is where all content is restricted, has restricted access, and it must be paid for before access is granted. Usually what we find with these models is that in return, for paying for the content, there is exclusive content behind the paywall, 
and in the example of the Times and also the Sun, the News UK titles, they have exclusive access to Premier League footage and highlights. So they're models that I'm sure everybody on the webinar is familiar with, um, but what about the technology that's powering them? How have these uh, implementations been delivered? What we found is that most of them come from in-house development. So the issue with that, with that, the challenge that we find with that is that when you're developing this technology internally, you're more focused on what you need right here and now, as opposed to what you may need in the future. So that limits flexibility and means that, yes, it may work perfectly for day one, but on day 31 or 101, what you want to do that far in the future may not be possible. And if it is, it's often a very technical change that's required. It's often not done by marketing teams or product teams where ideally we think that's the type of person within your business who should be able to change the meter. We also see that they're not cloud-based. They're often hardware-based solutions where maybe it's built into the web servers or implemented in the CMS in some way. That means that there's often a high cost of ownership associated with metering to pay for the hardware, to pay for the storage, the power. And it also means that the efficiency could, uh, could be a detriment. And the final piece there is the speed to market. What we found, the publishers often try to get these solutions out there as quickly as possible. Uh, and they, they have issues, they have bugs, but they look to fix them once they're live. The problem with that is that one bug often creates 10 more bugs. And if you don't fix those before you go live, it's likely that the experience your customers will, will, will come to find on the website isn't as you once hoped. So there's some um, ideas that we've garnered from the, the market today about the models that you're using and how they've gone about implementing those models. But what we found and what's typical for metering is that behind the meter lie entitlements. Um, we use the metaphor that an entitlement is the key to access content. And like a physical key, we think entitlements should only be given out when you know about the user. And the user and the entitlements can come in many shapes and sizes. And what we find typically is that entitlements are based on the following areas. We have content-based entitlements where users are given access according to keywords in the content or something in the URL or metadata associated with, with the content itself. There are also time-based rules and time-based entitlements where the user may give, get given a fixed number of articles per month or free access between a set period of time. Access-based rules, so according to where the user is coming from, their IP address and therefore their geolocation, but also the referrer. These can be entitlement sets that control people's access to your content. In terms of referrer, a good idea or a good example would be uh, somebody coming direct to the website may get 20 page views, but somebody who's coming from cost per click advertising or direct from a search engine where there's a paid for um, incentive to come has a, maybe only 10 page views rather than the full 20. The fourth option there is that it, Often these newspaper companies and publishing companies have a system in-house already that is managing entitlements and they've simply passed that data into the metering application and that's where all the decisions and all the rules are created and managed from. So that's the rule sets, that's metering as we know it today, but what we'll look at next is the types of users that metering helps publishers identify. So the first one that we, we, we look at is the anonymous user. These are people who visit your sites and your apps very infrequently. They probably just read a small number of articles, kind of a minimal number of page views. And it appears on the face of it that they're seemingly unlikely to pay for your content. But could they be incentivized to register if you came up with an innovative offering or bundle that suited them as an individual, not as a group of people? The second set of users are the on-the-go users. These are people who access your site via mobile devices only, and this is usually at set times of the day. So this could be on their morning commute or in the evening when they're watching television on the sofa at home. Um, and we think maybe with these guys, time-based metering could be applied. So trying to generate revenue from them at those set periods of the day when they're likely to be using your applications and your websites. The, uh, the third type of user is the occasional user somebody who visits the site or the apps from time to time. There's no real pattern in when they're visiting. It's kind of ad hoc. Um, and we think with these users, if you could learn a bit more about them, if they would share some data with you or answer some questions for you, you could make them more loyal, make them use the site more often. And if you know more about them, you can tailor the experience so you can do that and hopefully get them to register to sign up and ultimately pay for your content. 
The next user group is the multi-device user. So these are loyal customers who are loyal to your content and will quickly adopt new services that you launch. So if you launch a new app or you put something out on a connected TV or you do some kind of affiliate model, they're likely to go for it and likely to use that service. Uh, they visit the site frequently from lots of different devices. So the nature of their uh, viewing habits, potentially bundles that are device-based as opposed to content-based are more suited to this user group. The next user is the loyal paying user. So somebody's already paying for your content. They already pay for your content. So the, the trick here isn't how to get them to sign up in the first place. It's how to keep them happy and how to keep them paying for the service and to maximize their ARPU, their average revenue per user. Uh, this could be done potentially with bonuses and promotions or by personalizing the content to drive up their expenditure. And the more you know about them, the better you can personalize your content and hopefully the more money you can extract from them. And then the final group of users is the trialing user. This is a new concept for us, but this is the type of person who, who likes your content. They could be an occasional user, an anonymous user, maybe an on-the-go user. They definitely want to view your content, but they're reluctant to pay for it. So how about unbundling your content and creating something specifically for them, giving them an increased perception of the value of your content? So these are the people, and if you're like me, where you see a trial period for, for Netflix or for Spotify, where you sign up today and get the first month for free, they'll do that every time, but at the end of the month, they cancel rather than let the subscription renew. We're trying to find ways to get those people to sign into a longer-term contract and have a commitment to pay for your services. So that's what we know about metering up until today. Uh, what we want to look at next are the opportunities that we think metering can create for you. Um, and the way these opportunities are created are by the emergence of new technology, are by um, innovations in the marketplace, changing customer preferences, and all of this en enables you to create alternative revenue streams. So the first thing we'll look at, we've split this section into two, into two are the, uh, the metering models that are very much data-centric. So these are survey metering, so asking people questions, and in return for those questions, uh, they are given access to content. So that could be uh, answer these three questions. What is your favorite car? What is your favorite brand of car? What is your favorite holiday destination? In return for answering those three questions, they're given five page views, 10 page views, and hours free access. Uh, and the, the benefit to the publisher here is that they can take that data and they can optimize advertising, but they can also start to build a profile for that user, even though they may be virtually anonymous. Um, the second data-centric model is the idea of social metering or share walls, where if somebody shares one of your articles on Facebook or LinkedIn or Twitter, in exchange for doing so, they're granted an entitlement to view more content, again, time-based or a certain number of articles. Uh, and with social sign-on becoming more and more prevalent, this becomes easier and easier to achieve. And then the third data-centric model is the concept of silent metering, where the meter is there, the limit is set to infinite, 99999, Nobody will ever hit it, and it's there purely as a data collection tool. So it's understanding what the audience do, understanding what they like, and using that data then to tailor the website, to lay out the CMS better, to, to move advertising around, and to just to create a better user experience, which ultimately could lead to implementing a paid-for content model. But all of those models are very much focused on knowing your customer, because all customers are different. They may look the same on the face of it, but behind the scenes, when you dig a little bit deeper, they all have different preferences and different uh, needs and wants. So once you get to learn about these customers, what you can do is, is unlimited, really. Uh, the first thing we think it allows you to do is optimize user experiences to, as I say, move pages around, create different layouts, to curate content, especially for those users. Once you've done that, you can then grow the dwell time of your website. People will stay on your website longer if it's engaging, if it's what they want to see. The longer they're on your website, the more adverts they will be exposed to, so the higher revenues you will get from those indirect means through advertising platforms. And if the content is tailored and customized to them, there's more chance that they will buy something there. The conversion rates will go up, and the upsell opportunities increase all the time. Again, increasing ARPU, but also reducing the churn and the number of people leaving the service. So that's data-based models. Um, the next set of models are more revenue-based models. So the first one, and this has been announced uh, only this week in the press, and it will be adopted by the Winnipeg Free Press over in Canada and will be powered by MPP Global, is post-pay metering. So this is the idea that the customer comes to your website, they're anonymous, but they sign up, 
Um, they don't have to deposit any money though, they simply register for the service, input their payment details, and then they're able to browse the content. Each article or each area of content has a value attributed to it, and every time they click on something, a tally or a log of what they're spending is kept. When the balance of that account hits a certain threshold, maybe £10 as in, as in the example on the screen, we then go to the bank and we settle their account and we simply start again. So in this model, there is no barrier to entry to the customer and it's very much based on what they're viewing, not asking somebody to pay £30 a month when maybe they only read five or six articles and it seems strange to pay so much for so little content. The next model is tailored metering. So that again, knowing your customers, creating models that are specific to them. One idea that's been spoken about quite recently is the idea of having multiple meters on a single website. So potentially having one meter across the whole website, every area, but then having smaller meters on content specific areas such as sport, tech, or world news. So the, the, the big meter, if you like, is set to 20 articles, but each individual smaller meter is set to five articles. If somebody reaches their five article limit on sport, they're then given the option to buy just the sports content for three pounds or to buy the whole website for 10 pounds. They buy the sport content for, for three pounds and then they continue on the rest of the website. They reach the meter count on tech. They can add the tech bundle. So you add the tech content to their bundle for an additional two pounds, bringing their total spend to five pounds, or they could buy the full website access at nine pounds a reduction of one pound on the original price offered to them. And then the third model here is hybrid metering. This is really taking a combination of all the things we've just seen and putting something together that's unique to your business. It could be a combination of micropayments, with surveys, with data collection, with freemium models. Really, how you do this is completely up to you, and we would always say make sure it's what your customers are more likely to be responsive to. And to give you an idea of what's possible with hybrid metering, all of the different models that we've looked at so far are displayed on this slide at the moment. Okay, so to move on, the next thing we'll do is look at the res results from our survey. So say we, we sent a survey out to a couple of hundred people that we, we know very well or existing clients or people who've responded via LinkedIn and social means. Um, and these are the main topics that were, just, were brought up. The first one we've already answered really, and it was the idea of if it's possible to merge and combine strategies with, with meters, so to create a hybrid model, and hopefully we've already answered that question for you. Um, another example that we, we've been speaking to um, companies about is the concept of combining a freemium model with metered models, so whereby you have the freemium model where most of the content on the website is absolutely free, but the premium model, sorry, the premium content that is usually paid for, there is a meter running there where maybe they get two or three articles per month for free rather than having to pay for it from day one. That would be very easy to achieve using the right metering technology. The second point is the how marketing offers and promotions can be work can be used in collaboration with metering. Um, of course they can. We would absolutely recommend that you do this because they're Offers, promotions, voucher codes, trial periods are the best way to encourage people to use your website. Um, an idea around this is creating voucher codes that give a user a set number of page views or a set number of time on the website, and that would only be possible with an entitlement engine and a meter in play. The third area, security and stability. The idea of security is one that comes up a lot, and it's something that we and I'm sure all the other vendors in the market are looking to to maximize as much as possible because you'll all know that there are always going to be people who try to get around the paywall. That's the nature of this business. Um, so what we think is if the people are, are that determined to get around the paywall, regardless of how much work is being done by MPP Global or any other vendor out there, they're always going to get around it and it, they're always going to find a way and they're probably never likely to pay for your content. So why focus on keeping those few out when you should be focusing your time and attention on focusing your time and attention on the people who want to use the site, who are willing to pay, and put that effort into creating um, user experiences that are curated for them that they're more likely to purchase. In terms of stability, the idea that a meter can slow down a website or would make it more temperamental, yes, potentially in the older days, but now with cloud technology and the ability to localize a cloud to a certain territory, we think that stability in metering is the best it's ever been. The ability to scale and to extend the service over one website as traffic goes up and up, 
or across multiple services as um, as the, the the reach of the the, the meter increases is more and more easy easily done these days than it was when it was all hardware based and obviously the costs associated associated with having it uh, built around hardware implementations and the fourth and final kind of key area was a question that we we don't really know the answer to because it depends really again on the audience should you show your customers the meter count you've had your eight pages there are two left as an example we don't really see this in the UK we couldn't find any examples where it lets you see how many pages you've got before you're going to hit the paywall but certainly in the States and in mainland Europe this is quite popular so it's possible but to answer the question directly yes it is possible if it's advisable it's kind of for you as the, the business to decide you know your customer and your audience better than we ever will and what we would say though when considering this if you do show your customers how many articles they have left and then for some reason they don't have that number or they have more than that or less than that it's likely to cause an influx of questions and queries to your customer support team that if you didn't show them the the number wouldn't be there in the first place so that's just one thing to bear in mind of course working in this business we are often asked around best practice what should we do and again we, we don't know what you should do specifically because your knowledge of the audience the content that you're selling the preferences of your audience are better known to you than they will ever be known to us but we think there are four main areas that you should at least be considering when implementing a meter the first are the rules and the policies a rule is the decision that's made whether somebody should or shouldn't be able to access content we're of the opinion that you should have multiple rules and policies to begin with and as you can see which ones are working which ones are successful try to hone in and try to make the most of those rules and the ones that aren't working disregard and then this will over time allow you to focus on the areas of the business that are making the most revenue the second thing is analytics a meter is going to create an awful lot of data all of this data is absolutely useful and it should be used by as many areas of the business as possible so marketing to understand preferences the CMS to arrange the page in the most effective manner email marketing finance churn prevention price teams all of these guys should be using the analytics information from the meter to optimize your business practices um, testing similar to rules and policies really make sure you test everything before you go live have several use cases based on your rules so for customers inside your territory outside your territory coming from Facebook coming from Google whatever it is that you're trying to meet or and trying to uh, create a model around make sure you test it thoroughly and not only when you're going live but continuously to make sure it is still working and is still being uh, productive and successful for you and then the fourth idea is flexibility you need to be able to change customers change people change all the time so on that basis so should your meter so should your strategy and you need to make sure flexibility is key to your thinking when looking to either implement a meter that you've designed and developed yourselves or outsource this requirement to a specialist vendor so we've touched on this earlier but external development do you want to build this in-house or do you want to outsource it to a specialist we've mentioned the challenges that external development can cause but potentially it is the best option for you this is something you should consider deeply um, there's obviously the cost associated with it and the the future thinking that would go into external development um, but it's obviously an option there but maybe there's a, a middle ground where your exter your internal teams who know the market paired with a specialist like MPP can create a very innovative model that's specific and suited perfectly to your marketplace uh, so in terms of models be flexible one size does not fit all all audiences are different all businesses are different all content is different so try and create a strategy based around your customers and your content and adapt that strategy test that strategy and have it so it's a, a continuous process not a, a hard and fast decision that will never change in the future consider the cloud cloud has many benefits there's the cost of ownership there is no need for hardware there's the scalability the ability to extend the service across many different websites many different services within your group and there's also the speed to market there is no need to install anything it's there it's out of the box it's ready to go so consider cloud when when looking at metering technology the third sorry the fourth idea uh, is revenue and data some people think these don't always go hand in hand you have people just interested in what the data is saying some people interested in how much money is being made 
but these absolutely go hand in hand with one another. The more data you have, the more you can customize experiences and learn about your audience and hopefully extract more revenue from them. The more revenue you're generating, the more you know about customers' paying preferences, their paying life cycle, how they pay for content, how they want to pay for content, which price points are working. So use revenue and data in collaboration to optimize the meter and the, eventually the paywall. Personalization, again, the more you know about the customers, the more you can tailor the content and the experience to suit them. The better experience they have, the higher conversion rate, the more likely they are to, to share their, their hard-earned money with you. And this isn't just the personalization of what they can see, but the personalization behind the scenes in terms of your marketing activities. Although it's not designed at a specific person, it could be designed at groups of people and tailored about, about what you're gathering from the individual customers from the meter. So this big data idea, I suppose, is what I'm getting at. And the final point there is integration opportunities. The data in the meter, hopefully, <laughs> you've realized, is uh, priceless to your business. So you need to make sure you can share it with other systems in your architecture. So make sure, however you integrate a meter, that the data can flow freely. Make sure it can get to finance, to ERP, to CRM, to CMS, and marketing systems, so whatever you decide to do. And then potentially there's another opportunity here to share that data with external companies and make revenue from, from data collection and data sale also. So they're the six key areas that we think you should be considering when looking at meters. Of course, there are more, but they're the ones that have kind of come out in the wash with our recent survey and our recent questionnaires. Um, that's the end of our presentation this afternoon. So hopefully you've felt like you've learned a little bit and you've found the session productive. Um, I'll open the floor now to questions. Um, and if anybody has one, as I said at the start, don't um, don't feel shy. Just at, click the hand and feel free to ask away. Okay, so there's a couple of questions here um, from a few of the audience. Um, one of them relates to post-pay metering. So the question is, micropayments have been tried and failed by publishers before. Do you think post-pay metering will work? I guess it's a difficult question to answer because nobody has gone live with this just yet, but the nearest use case I can give is iTunes. iTunes, if you think about it as a fundamental system, is selling content, be that music, apps, games, and it works to a post-pay model. You sign up to iTunes, you create an account, you type in your credit card, you don't pay for anything at the point of purchase. You buy one song or one app for 79p, you wait maybe two, three, four days until you see the invoice in your inbox. That's because Apple are looking to see how much you'll spend during that visit, and if you're going to spend more than 79p, they can bundle that value together into one transaction and keep their costs at the bank to a minimum. So it works for iTunes, it works very successfully, as I'm sure you're all aware, and I'm sure you <laughs> all pay your 30% to iTunes. So if it can work for those guys, why can't it work for a newspaper with a loyal audience with regional specific content that people are willing to pay for? Um, another question is any examples of the metered model implemented by magazine publishers? Um, I mentioned it right at the start, but the New Yorker, uh, the Condé Nast publication, has a metered model uh, where their weekly newspaper, I, I'm not sure off the top of my head of the exact number of free articles you get, but you can certainly go into that site, view long-form written content for free, and when you've read a set amount of articles, you're asked to register and then to pay for the content. And there were recent stats and um, PR pieces from Condé Nast explaining what they've learned from, from, the, from the magazine. And it's worth iterating that The New Yorker is a, a weekly magazine as opposed to a daily magazine. I didn't mention that in the, the question itself. Um, so as it says on the screen, if you've got any questions, if you'd like to know anything else, there are some contact details available on the screen right now. We will be sending a recording or a link to a recording of this webinar round as well. But feel free to reach out, give us a shout, and we will be happy to, to continue the conversation offline. Thanks for all for attending, and we hope to speak to you soon.